Perfect. Good evening, everyone. Very good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me and see us on the screen. If you can, may I please request you to type in a chat, uh, type in a yes in the chat box so that we know that you're here and mm -hmm. you're listening. Perfect. Good evening, Mani. Jia, thank you. Vidhi, good evening. Dimpi, thank you. Prachi, thank you so much. Aditya, all right. Lots of yeses coming in. A very good evening, everyone. Perfect. I think uh, we are audible and visible clearly, the Pankar. We're good to go. Yes. Let's just hope that the bandwidth that we have right now is up with the network continues to stay through the year. Uh, can you stay through the hour? Uh, because technology has its own way of messing up. And uh, just in case, students, you have a technical issue, you face an audio or a video lag, uh, please remember that there is a red button that's called reconnect on the top of your screens. Uh, in case of an audio or a video lag, you just need to press that button and you'll be redirected to the webinar where you can listen to the interesting conversations that we're going to be having today. Uh, in case of a technical glitch, please mention that in the chat box as well, because Mind the Team is online, as always, in the chat box to be able to help you with your questions. Which also brings me to another point, which is please use the chat box option very, very judiciously. If we ask any questions, which we will be asking quite a lot, because Anjita has a habit of grilling everybody that she's speaking to. So she'll ask a lot of questions, and so will I. Uh, please, men, men, please remember that you need to answer those questions uh, in the chat box. And if you have any questions that you want to be able to ask us, those questions need to go in the chat box as well. With that, let's begin our conversations. And today we are excitedly talking about perhaps one of the most diverse, perhaps one of the most impactful, and perhaps one of the most neutral subjects there is, which is economics. Now, economics is one of those subjects, my friends, which can merge very easily with sciences. It can merge very easily with commerce and also with the humanities. So Absolutely. economics, personally, for me, is something which is not a subject per se. It's a way of life. Now, for example, the studies of economics, of demand and supply, they are as applicable to the sabziwala that you see around your house as it is to, let's say, Mr. Mukesh Ambani, who also works on, on, on principles of demand and supply. So economics is one of those domains which is applicable for all walks of life. Now, right, for, for example, from your, from your daily sabziwala who understands that you know, for example, these three vegetables or four vegetables see the maximum demand from this colony. So I need to get more quantities to be, so that I can, I can get those vegetables across and get more money. Versus these vegetables do not see much demand. So let me kind of tone that down. Two, let's say, production houses, two, let's say, companies, manufacturers, who will also work on the similar principles to, to decide what quantity of, of a particular commodity needs to be manufactured and at what price does it need to be sold. Those decisions base the form of, of economics, which is not just, like I said, it's not a subject, it's a way of life. Um, and I think that economics is one of those domains which is equally applicable to the, to the, to the household at is, as it is to the entire community, as it is to the entire nation, and for that matter, the entire world. Because everything, my friends, rests on this one domain called economics. Anjita, over to you. Thank you so much, Dipankar. I think everybody got a good insight about what we're going to talk about today, right from our niche pocket monies to our GDPs and to the tax that we pay. We're going to talk about everything here. Before yeah. moving ahead, let me first introduce our panelists today. I am Anchita, and uh, we have with us Mr. Chirag Mehta and the banker uh, from my team. Chirag uh, Mehta is, uh, obtained his bachelor's in economics honors from St. Stephen's College, University of Delhi, following which he completed his master's degree in economics from the London, Schools of, London School of Economics and Political Science. Thereafter, he worked as an investment banker for two years with HSBC London before returning to India and taking up a career in the education sector. He has also worked as a consultant with the education team of World Bank in New Delhi. He's a passionate educationist and has taught various courses in economics to several batches at ISBF. He has also been actively associated with student outreach initiatives in the past 
conducting several sessions in schools, colleges across the country. As associate director, he currently looks after all dimensions of student welfare, development, and learning. We welcome you, sir. The banker, as uh, most of you must have uh, seen him before, he's the growth and creative lead at Mindler and also leads the international education and liberal arts practice. With experience in social change management, skill building, and business strategy, the banker is a diligent business professional. He also sits on the advisory council of the Global Shapers Community at the World Economic Forum. Thank you so much for joining us, the banker. Thank you so much. And myself, uh, I am a career specialist at Mindler. I am a proud alum of University of Delhi and the elusive Indian Institute of Psychology and Research. I am an ardent advocate of informed career decision making. So let's get started and uh, talk about economics now. OK, just for everybody to set the ground here, right? What is economics? Let's just look at that and understand that. I want my audience to go ahead, get ready with their chat boxes and type in what exactly do you understand by economics? Any answers? I'm expecting some answers. There's a certain lag that we are having in the chat box. In the meanwhile, um, economics is the practical and theoretical science of production and distribution of wealth. When I come around and talk about this broad definition, it's basically based around the system of buying, producing, and selling of goods and services. As simple as exactly, it's basically a study of consumer and product. We're getting a lot of answers now. As a social science, it's primarily concerned with behavior and relationships of people and societies. Economics is applied in the real world to study and analyze the activities and interaction between people, market, and the government, if I'm putting that correctly. There are a lot of subdivisions in economics, as we all know. Let's just understand what the two areas that we will be talking about. One is the macroeconomics and the other is microeconomics. Macroeconomics uh, is majorly a branch of economics which is considered or concerned with the whole economy. For example, macroeconomics is concerned with the economic growth, the unemployment, the rate of inflation, how fast prices are increasing, how people are losing jobs, and all of these questions. Whereas microeconomics is a branch of economics that focuses only on individual markets, individual decisions. For example, factor that determines the prices of any, any particular commodity, oil, cars, and how it changes and affects the consumers as well as the producers. So just a good understanding about what macro and microeconomics is. Now, you know, as a student, I've always wondered this answer, and I've always had this question, why do we actually study economics? You know, what's the, what's the fun? So how do you actually frame that answer? Students um, who study economics always look at it as a subject of buying and selling. It's always framed that way. Economics, however, is the study of how society use uh, scarce resources to produce valuable commodities and distribute them among the different people. Behind this definition, there are two particular ideas in economics. One, the goods are in limited quantity. Second, that the society must use its resources efficiently. Students who study economics not only gain the skill set to understand complex markets, and obviously understand why do we have a whole newspaper uh, just related to economics, but also come along with strong analytical and problem solving skills, as well as business acumen necessary to succeed in the professional world, Economics is extremely useful, not just for business professionals, but professionals all over the industry. Now, when I say all over the industry, yes, uh, as the banker was also rightly mentioning that economics is something very, very broad. And we can relate it to each and every subject that you can think of, whether it's philosophy, whether it's psychology, whether it's politics, whether it's sociology, mathematics, physics, and you name it. 
economic somewhere or the other has some or the other role to play um just to give you a good understanding about some of the fields let's just say how are economics and psychology related let's go back to 1970s economists became more interested in the effect of psychology in decision making the term behavior economics that we study today um new economists challenged this assumption individually on the basis of rationale but actually it could be heavily influenced through various psychological factors for example the power of nudges and framing people do respond to stimuli and make easy decisions right so each and every aspect of economics and psychology are related now let's go down to the field of sociology sociology is concerned with understanding social structures societies interacting with people one aspect of sociology is the economic perspective it's about how differences in the income affect life changes for example the economist william stanley coined the term economic sociology in 1879 to describe the work on class and social norms on economic decisions and outcomes so this is wherein i am saying that economics has spread its wings to almost each and every domain when i talk about one other field let's say philosophy you know there's a strong link now how most of you might just question me saying ma'am how is philosophy and economics related now there's a very very strong link between economics and philosophy economics may try to be uh, neutral about the study of economics however some economists say that it's not a morality play but at the same time the economic choices are somewhere or the other influenced by philosophy the extent to which government intervenes is influenced by philosophical beliefs which is more important to the fact that equality of individual freedom adam smith noted down how individual self interest could lead to common good despite selfish interest rather than because of however smith was more of a moral philosopher and felt that principles of justice and fairness were intrinsic to the civil society economists and their interactions were mostly based on the barter system insights from anthropology also suggest the same this is how economics has been related to the most of the areas moving on to that um somewhere or the other this is something that we take up as choices right in our schools and then we finally make the decision of going ahead to doing bachelors here moving on let's discuss about how are the degrees in economics look like what are the kind of options do we have so i will hand it over to the parker now thank you so much anjuka that was indeed a very deep dive into the terrain of economics and a good refresher in history of economics so thank you so much for bringing that up all right so friends when we talk about economics we need to understand that this is one of those domains like anjuka mentioned which is pervasive so there are lots and lots of careers that you can get into with economics economics can literally merge with psychology and create a domain called behavioral economics it can merge with statistics and mathematics and go for data sciences data analysis economics can work with mathematics to form a career called econometrics where you work on trends where you work on numbers to to kind of estimate what would the gdp be uh you can also work with international relations so right from international relations to diplomacy to negotiations to conflict management to working with uh to working with all sorts of international organizations like the UN World Bank etc uh economics is critical to that economics can merge with management consulting economics can merge with investment banking economics can work with we start with stock markets uh economics can work with capital markets in economics can work with public policy so right from identifying what is the need of policy to actually creating one implementing it pivoting it and then finally creating a policy around it can also be a part of economics economics can lead to financial planning economics can lead to taxation economics can lead to lot of statistics economics can lead to multiple options so the domain of economics my friends is very pervasive there is so many options with economics now that we understood that economics is one of those options which are there and which are there so much in 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 quantity what do we have in india in the undergraduate level we get a degree called economics honors at most places 
at some places the domain of economics also allows you to pursue a few minors along that for example you can get degrees in economics and finance you can get degrees in economics and political science you can get degrees in economics and philosophy you can get degrees in economics and philosophy uh, economics and, uh, and and sociology economics and psychology all those options are available to you but at most places in india you will either find two domains which is one is ba economics honors or second would be a bsc economics honors a lot of times students come back and ask us okay if economics is is really one domain why the different degrees why do we have a ba economics versus a bsc economics what's the difference the difference between ba economics and bsc economics is not much it is about what is the course curriculum involved now for example uh, if you if you remember your class 11th definitions you would have uh, when you look at the first chapter of economics in class 11th you would notice that uh, the first chapter says economics is both an art and a science so economics is not a science per se or it's an art, art per se it's both of those so when you approach the domain of economics through the art angle through the humanities angle of how something economics how are something like economics affects people affects employment affects poverty affects so many trends it becomes a ba economics the route to go to getting there is is through ba when you talk about economics and the more mathematical side to it for example statistics for for example econometrics for example uh engagement of 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 economics into different areas all that becomes a sciences degree now what one of the most critical uh, consideration for you to consider is that whether you are sciences or commerce or or humanities the idea is that economics can be pursued with any domain but there's a very strong consideration here the consideration is that in order to study economics in india at most places colleges would ask students to have mathematics in class 11th and 12th so if you don't have class 11th and 12th mathematics at most places in the country economics will be very elusive and it may not be offered to you at a few places there are areas where you can still approach economics as a part of uh, as a part of different different areas every economics degree is will be a combination of mathematical element as well as the the theoretical element but the idea is that when you mix them both there'll be certain level which is going to be on the higher end so for example with economics there is so much more you can go forward with you will study something called budget economics on for example when the budget comes around what is the implication of that budget you will study something called public economics you will study something called government economics you will study something called developmental economics and this is one of those domains which is very very trending these days because people of our generation students such as yourselves they have taken the onus of the country's development society's development upon themselves and they are in a position to say okay we will utilize our knowledge we will utilize our skills for the betterment of our society and betterment of our country and that is where a field like developmental economics comes into picture so economics is one of those domains which are which is which is exemplary open which is like a very 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 broad domain and of course as we go deeper into the webinar we will ask chirag for his inputs as well one last point before i i want to cover that before i hand it over to uh to 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 chirag for his thoughts is admissions now after getting so much knowledge about what economics is and what it entails how do we get admissions economics is perhaps one of those areas where you can get into it via three processes number 1 you can get through to the board merit so for example if you're somebody who's theoretically very correct you are somebody who is who's a rock star with academics and you have never scored less than 95 in your in your in your life which means that in class 12th you're all set to secure great marks so with those great marks of class 12th merit you can go to colleges like delhi university you can go to colleges like mumbai university pune university hyderabad university chandigarh university bangalore university and go forward and look at entrance or entry into that criteria entry into that college with a we your class 12th marks that's one area second area of entry into economics is basis entrance examinations now economics is one of those areas for example universities like christ university bangalore conducts an entrance examination for entry into their economics program which means that beyond your class 12th academics you need to be engaging in some kind of an aptitude preparation so whether it is for example your logical reasoning skills 
or your mathematical skills or your verbal and, and, and communication skills or your general awareness. All of those areas will contribute to your success on the entrance examination. And that becomes your second way of entry into college. The third way to look at college admissions in India is basis your profile. Now, many liberal arts universities across the country, such as uh, Flame University in Pune or Ashoka University or Azim Premji University or uh, or Narsimunji or Symbiasis School of Liberal Arts or, or other areas as well. These are places where your admission can happen through basis of profiles. So profile means right from class 9 to 12, what is it that we have done? So our marks, our activities, our accomplishments, our internships, our research papers, etc. All of those are areas which will contribute towards your admission uh, to a great college. And on that note, I want to pick Chirag's mind on two things. So Chirag, what is your insight on, on whatever we've discussed now, anything that you'd like to add on to our discussion on economics? And particularly, what is ISPF's outlook on economics? What is the criteria that they look at for admissions? And what is the highlight of ISPF as a university which is providing uh, exceptional education in economics? Sure. Thanks a lot, Dibangar. It's been lovely uh, listening to uh, both you and Anchita. Uh, you've said a lot of things that align uh, very closely with my own understanding of and belief about economics. Uh, I picked up your three uh, objectives at the start, diverse, impactful and neutral. Uh, and I could not agree more with that. Uh, I, I can't remember whether it was you or Anchita, but one of, you, one of you mentioned and I saw that appear in the chat as well, that economics is really a way of life. Uh, which is also very true. We often talk about that among our, uh, among sort of our faculty group, uh, how it's become sort of, uh, you know, it's given us this logical thinking framework that helps us analyze all sorts of problems in life, even problems that have nothing to do with economics. Uh, it could be just making a very complicated travel plan or or making a very important spending decision. Uh, economics is just, it, it equips you with, with a thoroughly analytical mindset that helps you in all walks of life. Uh, the, the, the thoughts I'd add to that, so I actually uh, sort of conduct quite a few uh, economics career sessions myself. So I'm, I'm going to just sort of try and supplement what you guys have said and uh, maybe just uh, add, up, add very little really, not, not a hell of a lot. Uh, okay, that didn't work very well. Sorry about that. Uh, the presentation I uploaded uh, did not have this slide, so I'm going to try and do it here one more time. Uh, is my screen visible clearly, uh, Dipankar? Yes, it is. Should I yeah. make it see it very clearly? Okay, fantastic. So uh, I would encourage you to think about these three things, students, if you're thinking about whether economics is a good choice for you. Now, of course, please uh, remember the caveat that this is just one person's advice. And it is obviously a very high level thumb rule. But if you look at, uh, if you pick up the pa paper every day and are interested by economic issues, where is India's GDP growth going? What is the inflation rate? Are you watching what the RBI is doing? Does the budget interest you? Do the financial markets, which are very much a part of uh, the macro economy, a very integral part of, a uh, very useful also barometer of the of the macro economy. Are you, do you like watching what they are doing? That's a good sign. You know, uh, if you pick up the paper and look for that sort of thing uh, and don't yawn when you're reading it, uh, that's a good, you know, intuitive sign that you have some intrinsic motivation for the field. Uh, I'm going to jump to now the rightmost image on the screen. I don't know if you can tell, but that's a bit of a, Calculus smiley and a calculus frowny. The uh, Pankar has already pointed out the, in, the 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 sort of integral role that math plays in economics. I would go so far as to say that as far as pure economics is concerned, and the Pankar and Anchita are very correct in pointing out that economics you can literally draw a Venn diagram with economics in the center and circles all around it with geography, history, uh, psychology, math, statistics, uh, all sorts of other fields combining with economics. But I'm talking about pure economics at the moment. If you want to become an economist, uh, say a policymaker or an academic, uh, you need to have a, a, a smiling relationship with math. So I firmly believe that every 18 year old has a relationship with math. You know, it's kind of either love, 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 hate, hate, love or hate, hate. Uh, the first part is your relationship with math. And the second is how math feels towards you. The first part is important. As long as it's love from your side, uh, economics will welcome you because I would go so far as to say that maths is the language of economics. And I want to add there that please do not be any economics aspirants in the audience. Please do not be dissuaded uh, by maths or think of it as some sort of insurmountable, uh, you know, uh, area of study because I've seen a lot of students fall into that trap. Please understand one thing very clearly uh, about maths 
that that maths was invented to uh, when when language became too complicated you know if we could talk about n dimensional functions or functions with n variables in words we would do that we wouldn't have any need for math 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 is not there's nothing new that math is doing that language can't so if you're okay speaking the english language then math is really just another language that if you give it enough time there's no way you won't understand and pick up so there's no reason to be scared of it and the picture in the middle is a particularly important one because again if you're if you're looking to pursue a career uh, sort of purely as an economist uh, then you have to be prepared for grappling with extremely complex problems that's what i'm trying to portray with the middle image so this is a guy with uh, trying to solve a puzzle with lots of different pieces uh, you're going to be grappling with things like inequality poverty you know inflation gdp these are things that are terribly hard to even measure we we switched from the wholesale price index to the consumer price index some time ago as a way to measure inflation now imagine such a drastic change it changes our statistics completely uh, there is still no agreed one common measure to uh, of the poverty line there are there are so many different measures out there so these are things that are extremely hard to even measure let alone to solve or even to begin to solve right so that is why it can often require a lifetime of work before you get very very meaningful and satisfactory results but as uh, the banger said right at the start that it is an extremely impactful field the day you solve something you would have affected the lives of millions of people but you need to be able to keep going until you uh, reach that solution so that is something to bear in mind if you are somebody who likes uh, working on you know short problems small problems and keep moving on from one problem to the other then something like management which is also a related domain that may be your uh, area of specialization that you enjoy and this is not some you know moral science lesson ki oh all the ones who are grappling with the harder questions of inequality and poverty are the ones who are sort of doing the right thing so to speak and the ones who are ma- managers and trying to make money are the sort of you know low lives or the ones who sold their soul i i don't believe that it's about you know what are your interests what are you good at what do you enjoy on a day to day basis what, what gives you a good night of sleep right uh, so try and align your career choices with your uh, interests and that's all i'm trying to say with with this slide with your interest in the cues that your daily behavior is giving you uh, i had one more slide but i'm going to uh, stop there as far as this is concerned because this this itself took me longer than expected uh, let me pull up a different presentation on my screen now uh, and tell you a little bit about what we do at ispf as far as uh, economics is concerned which was the pankar's other question uh when we so i went to delhi university as was said in my introduction uh uh anjita i i know you are also a delhi university a proud delhi university uh, graduate to to use your words so uh, you may want to switch your uh, sort of put the volume off on your laptop or something for the next bit uh, <laughs> but uh, no i mean i had i had 3 years Three of my best years of life uh, at Delhi University, uh, but almost none of that had to do with the academic value it added to me, right? Which is unfortunate because that's what I signed up for. I didn't sign up to have great fun in the hostel. That was that was fantastic along the way. Uh, but you know, uh, 2006, our director, uh, Dr. Jaden Chadda, who's an alumnus of uh, Warwick Business School, and then came back to do a PhD in uh, in FMS, uh, Delhi University. Uh, he uh, And, and this is a, a shared passion among everybody at ISBF. We feel that the best that Indian higher education has to offer uh, is, is is still way way short of good enough, uh, because our schools are producing some of the brightest 18 year olds in the world. Why should they be shortchanged with a, a less than world class education? And that is the simple mission of ISBF uh, to to uh, partner with global giants, global higher education giants, and try and plug that gap until. you know something changes at the policy level and they are allowed to uh, sort of be here themselves so right now we are the we are the partner uh, which brings their education to india with the new education policy inviting them to open campuses in india uh, hopefully you know we would have been the front runner and kind of uh, have led to this hopefully we played some part along the way but uh, that is really been the mission of isbf and uh, we've been extremely fortunate to partner with really the best in the business for the last 15 years uh, lse is Uh, one of the biggest names in economics uh, in the world uh, and isbf has been a partner of university of london and lse since day one uh, now i make a point in my in each of my webinars uh, that because i've done it so often now i i'm pretty uh, sure about everything i'm saying 
uh, because I've been with ISVF eight years now, and I'm a huge believer in the programs uh, and what we the value that we offer uh, through our undergraduate and also postgraduate programs. Uh, and you see a very tall claim up there, right at the top of my slide. Don't take that claim lightly. Yeah, and I'm I'm not kind of making an approximate claim. I, I am claiming that it is a London School of Economics education that you get at ISVF. And let me uh, let me elaborate on that very quickly, which is which will also uh, answer the question that Dipankar asked me about ISVF. What is the highlight of uh, the institution? Now, the programs that we offer at ISVF are across three large genres: economics, management, and finance. Uh, LSE is ranked fifth for economics, fourth for accounting and finance, and tenth for business and management in the world today. This is as per the latest QS rankings by subject. Uh, and really, I mean, LSE's reputation. So, west of the UK, in the US, and in the Americas, basically, uh, LSE is trumped by Cambridge and Oxford. But east of the LSE, and especially in Asia, uh, LSE's reputation is really, at least from a perception and reputation point of view, I found is second to none as far as at least economics is concerned. Uh, and it's and even though you see it's ranked higher for finance, uh, the perception is is almost there for finance as well. Uh, and very much in the top league for management. So uh, the reason I say a London School of Economics education, and we'll focus on economics only today because that's the topic of discussion. Although this is all true for all 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 three sets of genres, or all three genres, uh, is point number one that an ISBF student studies exactly the same curriculum as a student at LSE. Feel free to sue me if you uh, find out otherwise. Yeah, uh, right to LSE actually. More uh, I mean, suing is unconstructive. We stuck in the courts forever, uh, but right to LSE to confirm these things. We, you know, uh, the, I, I really appreciate any career counseling initiatives that I see by high school counselors, by people such as Mindler, because uh, I was actually uh, looking at the Mindler website for the first time, and right after you started, Anshida, uh, because it sparked that curiosity in me, and I saw a very nice uh, little piece there saying that ad an adult spends seventy percent of their work life or, or their life at work. Uh, and therefore, I mean, you get to work based on some career choices that you make. And therefore, it is very important to make these choices in an informed manner. So, you know, why not why not hear it from the horse's mouth? And the horse I'm talking about here is LSE. So feel free to write to them. Uh, I invite you to write to them. Uh, so an ISBF student, point number one, studies exactly the same curriculum as a student at LSE. Speaking of the highly pedigreed economics curriculum at LSE, uh, a BSc economics student at ISBF would study the same curriculum if you were a contemporary of Dr. Urjit Patel, which you are not, but if you were, uh, you would study the same curriculum that he studied during his BSc economics program at LSE. For those who don't know who Dr. Urjit Patel is, he was the last RBI governor. Uh, the second thing that an ISBF student enjoys is parity of assessment standards. So the assessment stand. So imagine that the curriculum is the same, the starting point, and the end point is also exactly the same, which is the assessment standards. Every single mark that is awarded on an ISBF student's transcript. Uh, everything that goes into an ISBF student's University of London degree, which is my next point, uh, is, is awarded entirely and only by LSE academics. Uh, this is a huge deal because uh, I, 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 for shortage of time, I won't get into crazy details, but uh, I will again make a claim and leave it at that this time without offering much evidence. But this is really as deep as any international collaboration runs because in my eight years in higher education, I have not come across a single other international collaboration, be it with a much lower ranked university than LSE, where the where the international partner is correcting every single answer script for every single summative assessment entirely. They are not validating. They are not randomly checking 5% of the scripts. They are not checking half the scripts. They are the only ones ever checking the final scripts. And they are checking it based on the same processes and standards that are applied to LSE students at LSE in London. And the reason for that simply is this is a ginormous exercise. The only reason they undertake it is because they have to ultimately be able to say, put their name on the degree. The LSE name appears on the University of London degree, which is the third point I want to leave you with, that every ISBF student graduates with a University of London degree which also mentions LSE as the academic body behind the programs, which is actually what makes it equivalent to an LSE degree itself. And that is why LSE cares extremely deeply and must retain complete control over the assessment process in order to preserve its integrity.
because if it cannot guarantee the integrity of the assessment process it cannot guarantee the integrity of the grade and if it can't guarantee the integrity of the grade it can't guarantee the integrity of the degree award and therefore the quality of the graduate that the degree stands for and without that no institution is worth anything these half signals don't work really well in the market that oh i did a degree from this place but wo unka role aadha tha inka role aadha hai that sort of thing this is everything academic except the teaching comes from lse uh i've already said that every student graduates with the university of london degree and then the last thing i will say i mean the the the, the penultimate bullet point is now obvious that this is why i say that isbf students receive a london school of economics education which is a global top 10 education for any of the programs that we offer and the beauty is that you do this at a, at a quarter of the cost because you are by default pursuing the program in india but there are many many wonderful opportunities to also go to lse and study at lse for anything from 3 weeks to 2 years and we'll talk about that uh, hopefully a little bit later on uh, the last the fourth point i want to leave you with is that it is not just lse 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 all the way uh, the teaching which is extremely important which is the 3 years you spend at isbf you're spending it at an institution that lse recognizes of its completely of its own free will uh, as one of its top 5 teaching institutions in the world there are there are more than 70 70 teaching institutions feel free to just google this for yourself just a search for lse global teaching institutions click on the first link you'll see a page with 70 plus global teaching institutions five are featured on that page one of which is isbf informally we actually know from lse we're among their top two really but i can't offer any evidence there so i'm going to leave it at top five uh, which is really lse basically saying so the reason we are there is because our students have done exceptionally well on the programs year after year after year because of the kind of teaching support that they receive at isbf because they are a very strong peer group among themselves and they kind of pull each other up uh, and uh, and uh, that is basically lse uh, saying to the world that you know if you want to study our programs anywhere outside of london uh, these are the top 5 places to do it at and isbf is one of them so that is what we bring uh, dipankar anshita to the world of economics education uh, in india and we are very proud of that uh, very happy to sort of take any uh, questions uh, etc on this or, or on something else Perfect. thank you so much chirag that was really really encouraging and uh, you know when you mentioned about the fact that ispf happens to be one of the top 5 places to pursue lse programs i think uh, that's a very inquisitive and very interesting proposition for anybody looking at economics education in india and anshita i believe you had a few questions to ask of chirag absolutely um other than getting into the details of what delhi university offers us <laughs> let's just get to understand um chirag you spoke about the uh, the curriculum the variety that we study at ispf right i just want to expand want you to expand on that uh, what are the unique uh, career and learning opportunities that are available to students after pursuing programs at ispf okay fantastic so uh, the question is about after okay so uh, i'm i'm going to add one more uh, thing to to the question about after because there is a very unique opportunity that is during the program Uh, or or couple couple maybe sorry I'm getting carried away but a couple maybe uh, because I, I also mentioned that there are many ways to uh, experience LSE uh, while the programs are in India by default uh, there are many ways to experience LSE on the program let me just pull up a slide as a visual aid oh sorry this is a copy of the degree I was talking about it earlier I just put it up here but I'm moving on since we've gone past that subject um, so. yeah this is the first one i wanted to talk about which is a second year transfer now uh, it is currently incredibly hard to get into top global institutions for indian students who don't come from an international board so uh, just as a as as one figure that i'm aware of in 2018 2018 lse had 880 undergraduate uh, students from india uh, 77 of whom were from either ib or a levels backgrounds right that is not to dissuade others but to just say that you know it's again a signaling problem with uh, an indian qualification which begins in school and just gets worse and worse uh, afterwards uh, but the beauty of that is that with a proposition like isbf you can actually hope to get into lse just one year later you don't have to wait 3 years to go for a masters if you didn't get into the undergrad 
you can use the first year at ISBF as a stepping stone to get into the, uh, the the second year at LSE. Let me be very clear: this is not an exchange program. The whole batch does not go to LSE. This is earned by merit. However, the reason I'm bringing it up, nonetheless, is for is twofold. First of all, uh, why why do I say it's the best platform in India for a second year transfer? I I could actually argue for a much stronger claim. It is arguably the best platform in the world for a second year transfer to top foreign universities. I know that's a massive claim. Uh, I, I'll back it up some other day. Let me back up the claim on the slide at the moment. That uh, after my uh, undergraduate degree in economics from St. Stephen's College, uh, where I scored a first division, which is the highest division you can score. Uh, more importantly, I had a roommate who was Delhi University economics honors topper. He was also All India ISC topper of our batch. Uh, and we had similar career plans. So both of us applied to both LSE and Cambridge. I'll come to the LSE story afterwards. Both of us got accepted by Cambridge. Guess into what? Into the second year of Cambridge's undergraduate program. After completing our graduation at Delhi University with the first division. Forget me. Think about my roommate. He was. If you think DU is India's best uh, college for economics uh, or university for economics, sorry, uh, this guy is probably India's best candidate for economics in the world. Uh, sorry, uh, in India, this guy is India's best candidate for, for economics to anywhere in the world. I meant, right? And even this guy gets rejected uh, by uh, the, the reject is LSE actually. I forgot we were talking about Cambridge. All we get accepted onto is the second year of the undergrad. Now these and mind you, Cambridge is ranked uh, lower than LSE for economics. So you have this on the one hand, and what you have on the other hand is. 14 ISBF students, one four ISBF students in the last six years have received offers to transfer to LSE after one year. We were given an offer to go after three years to a lower ranked economics program than LSEs. We've had 14 students from ISBF receive, offer, receive offers to go into second year uh, after just one year at ISBF. And it's not just LSE. The simple matter is that the first year of an LSE program, an LSE first year education prepares you for second year anywhere in the world. And that's really what the next college cares about. Whether it's the ones on your screen, University of Edinburgh, Bristol, Kings, which are all top universities in the UK, UBC in Canada, Carnegie Mellon in the US, University of Hong Kong, whatever it may be. And to put that number of 14 in six years in context, for those who think that's not a very large number, uh, LSE, in, in LSE's own words, uh, over a similar period, it has not accepted as many transfer, so you're not made as many transfer offers to any other institution in the world. So ISBF sends LSE the maximum number of second year transfers in the world. And if you consider LSE is one of the top colleges in the world, that's where you can extrapolate from and say that it's arguably one of the top platforms in the world for a second year transfer to a top university. Because you're going through a global top 10 program, transferring from a global top 10 program to another uh, program second year is not particularly challenging. The success rates are extremely high. 40% of all applicants uh, who apply for the LSE transfer get in. Uh, with other colleges, the with other lower ranked colleges, the percentages are as high as 60, 75% uh, every year. So uh, that is one extremely uh, popular opportunity. Uh, by the same logic, and this is where I bring up the masters. Uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Uh, so I'm going now to after ISPF. By the same logic, three years of an LSE undergraduate education prepares you for any master's program anywhere in the world. And when I say any master's, obviously in a related discipline, doesn't prepare you for rocket science honors after eco honors. Uh, you have to go on to a master's in economics. That goes without saying. But uh, for eco, you are as attractive a candidate as there is as there is in the world, really. And this becomes extremely important in the post-COVID world. I don't know how many of you have followed this, but Twitter is one of the companies that has kind of led the way and has declared permanent work from home uh, in the future. It's never going to go back to the office for the foreseeable future anyway. What does that mean? That means that people, every, all Twitter employees will work remotely. If they are working remotely, as long as the internet connection is decent, what does it matter whether home is in New Orleans or in New Delhi? So the, the race for talent just got global in a very, very real way. It's Twitter right now. Many other companies will follow suit the longer this the, the pandemic drags on. And that is when global signals will stand out far more than local signals, such as a Delhi University. Painful as that is for me to say, because that's the signal on my CV. 
but uh, you know uh, global signals i mean a harvard or an, or, or or an oxford or you know any us any foreign university for that matter understands lse in university of london far far better than any local university in any country which is not terribly highly rated globally uh, so that is why i say that students have a substantial edge for a prestigious masters abroad uh, now coming back to my story uh, where i was uh, where i parked the lse part we also applied to lse both me and my roommate for the one year msc economics program this is lse's flagship postgraduate masters program uh, both of us as you can probably imagine from the story got rejected <laughs> we were but, but nevertheless uh, now this is this is a matter of suspense dipankar introduced me or uh, sorry anjita introduced me as having done a masters from lse was that a lie <laughs> uh, well that wasn't a lie uh, i'll break the suspense quickly we got made an offer to do a two year masters at econo- in economics at lse and we realized when we got made that offer which is why part of the reason i have this clarity uh, i mean it didn't dawn on me yesterday it's been a while uh, that is when we realized the first year of that two year masters program we spent entirely with uk lse undergrad students there was not another single postgrad student in our class because we were basically catching up with uk undergrads after completing our undergrad from one of india's top universities right uh, and progression from first year to second year was not based on just passing normally once you are accepted onto a program if you pass you progress but on this program because we had been accepted from a much lower ranked curriculum um, and university we were asked to actually get a 60% which in the lse scheme of things is pretty hard and as a, as a as a measure of that half the batch didn't make it into the masters year so they, these were the barriers that we faced despite completing an economics education from one of india's top universities right uh, the flip side here is this um, check this out in 2017 and 2018 two isbf students coincidentally real sisters received full scholarships for that one year msc economics program that i'm talking about i'm only putting up the cases that have got scholarship the students that got scholarships uh, i invite you to look on our website for the full list of students who have been accepted into this program over the years it's at least uh, coming up on about 10 students uh, two of which have gone there two years in a row on a full scholarship the same program that a du topper is rejected for right uh, again honestly between the transfer story and the master story if that doesn't tell you the chalk and cheese between a global economics education uh, or a world class economics education and a, and a, and the highest quality that we have to offer in india currently uh, i'm not sure you know there's much else i can say to that uh, to to help you see that uh, but this is this is entirely from my experience and uh, painful as it might be uh, i can't mince my words about it when i'm advising students uh the one other thing of course you know i'm i've clubbed everything else onto this slide uh naturally after a program in economics students can look to go to uh, so I, i think one of uh, the pankar and anshita also pointed out that it's a very neutral program i'd say it's neutral in two ways it welcomes students from all disciplines as long as you have math so at least at isbf the only admission criteria or oh, sorry that's the wrong way to put it the only eligibility criteria to be able to apply is to have math in class 12 we don't care if you studied economics before we don't care if you come from humanities or commerce or science or some other combination which doesn't have a name uh, all we care is if you have math you are welcome to apply for economics it is also extremely neutral in terms of the career paths it opens up afterwards you can go on to a management you can go on to a finance you can go on continue in economics almost just as easily i mean if you remember what was said in my introduction my training is purely as an economist yet i have been able to dabble very uh, you know comfortably in economics finance and management in my career so far and right now i'm doing education management so this is the management part of my career uh, so students can look to go on to a masters program at places like delhi school isi they have gone on actually this is not hypothetical including mbas at iims isb xlri etc there is a dedicated careers team that facilitates summer internships in, in leading organizations such as you know onsen young kpmg undp etc one year placements in london and new york with fortune 500 firms like morgan stanley ubs hsbc again none of this is hypothetical there are student pictures and names on our website feel free to reach out to them on 
social media and ask them more about their experiences uh, and of course final placements which for some reason is not on this slide uh, students have gone on to work for companies like mckinsey bain and company again ernst and young jwt across the range of uh, fmcg firms banks consulting firms etc and the last thing i will say here is the unique opportunity which is the lse summer school scholarship so i mentioned you can study anything from 3 weeks to 2 years the transfer is the way to study for 2 years the summer school scholarship is the way to study for 3 weeks every year because we are one of lse top 5 teaching institutions this is a privilege only given to the top teaching institutions every year we are allowed to select two students who will go to lse summer school on a on basically a completely paid summer school they just have to fly themselves back and forth uh, and they get they don't have to ever make an application to lse they can choose from one of over 100 courses at lse uh, uh, summer school which is one of the i think the second largest summer school in the world one of the most prestigious academic summer schools and uh, that is a very very coveted opportunity as well so between the lse summer school the transfer and the masters uh, and i think one thing i failed to say on the masters i i i think i moved on with the lse discussion if you see some of the other names on that slide there's harvard in there oxford yale chicago columbia nus ucl all of these i if i'm not wrong are top 50 universities in the world so those are the kind of opportunities that uh, the lse education at isb have unlocks for students sorry guys that was a long one but uh, it is just one of those that you know there are so many dimensions to talk about i've i've completely left out entrepreneurship right now uh, somebody like a ritesh agarwal is an isb alum i don't know it's a little known fact uh, ritesh agarwal is the founder ceo of uh, oyo rooms uh, but yeah i'm not going to go there so let's leave it at that <laughs> So uh, ironically, Chirag, when you mentioned that this was a long one, I think it covered remaining questions that we had for you. Okay, brilliant. So uh, I do have one final question. That's been something which has been asked quite a lot in the chat box. Sure. Uh, which is, what is the admission process? So you mentioned that you know math is the eligibility criteria for yeah. admission to ISPF. Yeah. So question number one would be: Is there a distinction between applied maths and core math that happens in class 11th and 12th? Right. And the second uh, question would be: What is the admission process? Does, does is there an examination? is there a board cut off what sure. is the process okay super uh, so let me just quickly dwell on that slide uh, you can ignore the bottom two programs since this is an eco session there are three variants of economics offered at isbf eco eco finance and eco management eco and eco finance the difference is self explanatory you drop some eco uh, electives and take some finance electives instead so if you have an interest in finance opt for eco finance over eco otherwise they are not terribly different the first two years are practically identical eco management is intended for those students who love economics but don't like the maths that comes with it right so you drop the math the quantitative modules and you and you take on some management modules instead you do as much economics in the first two years as an as an eco honor student the same subjects but you don't do the the mathematical subjects such as additional papers in maths and stats econometrics etc and you don't do the third year specialized economics papers so those are the three programs uh, for the first two as you can see math up to class 12 is compulsory and for economics and management maths up to class 10 is still compulsory which is honestly not hard uh, i think everybody in india does math up to class 10 if i'm not wrong or practically everybody uh, so that is the bare bones eligibility criteria as far as the selection criteria goes uh i am not entirely sure if i have included that uh in this presentation let me give it a quick check i usually do uh, ah these are some of the companies students have gone on to work for i keep moving okay this is all i have on admissions and scholarships but i will i will uh i will answer the question nonetheless without a visual aid uh it's a three step admission process so you have to apply online uh, you can actually apply offline also so you basically put in an application but 90-95% of students apply online, uh, which includes a statement of purpose, which is a very important component for your interview. Uh, the second step is to appear for the entrance test, which is also entirely online. After the entrance test, there is a shortlisting that happens. If you are shortlisted for the interview, uh, then the interview is held typically on campus, but obviously in such times we are doing it online. Uh, and like I already said, the SOP that you write in your application form. is a very important uh, component of the discussion during the interview uh, the test uh, there is a lot of very transparent guidance on the test and the interview on our website so instead of getting into details i'd invite everybody to look at that 
on the undergraduate admissions page. There is a sample paper with syllabus, advice on how to prepare and all of that. Similarly, for the interview, what are the four parameters? We actually transparently list the four parameters that we actually grade students on and, and, and give tips on how to prepare uh, for that. Because the way we see it is we don't like to test students on their ignorance. You know, After eight years in higher education, there are 20 things I don't know about higher education. Nobody knows everything. So we like to test students on their knowledge, not on their ignorance. So we want them to put their best foot forward. And our guidance is, is meant to facilitate that. We're happy to answer questions that we can answer even beyond that. We don't encourage students reaching out and saying, you know, uh, tell us what I can expect in the test very directly. Obviously, that's not going to happen. So it's a waste of time. Uh, but we're very happy to share guidance on how to prepare and that sort of thing. In line with the public university calendar, which is dragged on forever, uh, admissions uh, for 2020 is still open. Uh, but the session begins on the 13th of September. So uh, admissions will close soon. Uh, scholarships are available for all three years of study every year. Uh, and are up to 100% of the ISVF tuition fee. So I've added the scholarships angle, Devangar, but I've, I hope I've answered your question. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rag. Uh, there's one other question sure. which uh, which kind of comes up is the distinction of the mathematics. So student can have any kind of maths in class 11 yes. and 12 to be eligible? Uh, so, you know, this one's been asked of us a lot. I've actually uh, prepared this now offline, finally, because every IB school has been asking me this question. I just haven't memorized it yet, <laughs> uh, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say anything off the bat. Let me put down the principles here. Uh, what you need is knowledge of calculus, linear algebra, uh, statistics, right? Doesn't matter if your math is called AA or AH or HA or SL or HL. I, I mean, I know SL and HL. I understand that's from the old universe, uh, but it doesn't even even students with math SL. Uh, we don't discourage proactively from applying, but you will get because the, te the the math section of the entrance test is pegged at a class 10 level because it's a common entrance test for all five programs. Uh, the place where the class 11, 12 math is really tested is the interview. And you can expect to be thoroughly grilled on maths if you've opted for eco or eco finance. Uh, so you have to know these topics. It doesn't matter what your certificate says. But you're going to have to come good on these areas of math in order to be uh, have in order to have a shot at being accepted. As far as eligibility goes, as long as there is some math in class 11 and 12, we're happy to let you apply. We don't get into what math that is from an eligibility perspective. Sure, and that sounds nice. Uh, any question answer that stands out for you from the students? Um, I think Mr. Chirag has covered, I think, most of it and all of it. Um, just uh, one small thing that uh, we have been getting questions repeatedly on is about mathematics. And I hope that's clear. So irrespective of what level of mathematics you have, whether it's applied, whether it's IV, SL or HL, or the level of mathematics that you're studying in 11th and 12th, Please make sure that the topics that Mr. Chirag has mentioned, you have studied that in the in the past and especially from a point of view where entrance exam and interview are two of the admission processes steps so this is going to be a question that will be there so that's definitely there thank you so much uh, mr Chirag, for your time yeah, pleasure. Before, thank you. Thank, exactly uh before moving ahead and uh, closing this this is something that i want to uh, reflect and answer and educate all the students on Please understand uh, economics somewhere or the other will involve a certain amount of mathematics and statistics. And it is going to come in handy if you have studied that in 11th and 12th. It helps in your analytical reasoning, your logical reasoning, and also a thorough understanding of what is happening uh, around you. General knowledge is something extremely useful and important. Uh, for all of your questions, if I hope we have answered all of it, if not, please feel free to write to us at hello at the rate .com. And in case of any particular questions you have, you have any doubts in selecting the right colleges, you are confused with respect to where to go and move forward from here, or if it, even if the question is about applied or core mathematics, please feel free to reach out to us on hello at the rate .com. and uh, 
for the meanwhile thank you so much for attending the webinar throughout and for all of your questions thank you to all my panelists mr chirag it was great having you here it was lovely listening to you thank you so much to pankar and to all the rest of the audience and the mindler team who has been answering questions side by side thank you so thank much anjana thanks for everyone thanks for everyone who was here thank you students thank you mindler team and anjana i think you're going to have a very long discussion with chirag after the webinar on do you or do you that's going to be a common thread now uh, also very thank you everyone and take care of yourself have a great evening we'll see you on the time with yet another webinar and and until then please be be mindful that all of us are are trying to help you in picking a career picking a choice picking a course as per your interest and aptitude like anjana mentioned if you have any questions please feel free to reach out we're always there take care bye bye thank you bye bye